Okay, well, good morning or good evening or good afternoon, <laughs> wherever you, uh, you are right now. Uh, welcome to um, Q&A with the Gals Aurora. Uh, we have a little bit of business to take care of first. Uh, this is Gal's first time uh, speaking and presenting at DEF CON. And uh, not only that, it's also, I understand, his, uh, his wedding anniversary. Um, right. And, yeah. um, and, his, uh, and, and his wedding uh, occurred actually in Las Vegas. So right. unfortunately, as you guys know, we are all stuck at home. Um, <laughs> so we're not, we're not ones to let, uh, let, let the Rona get in the way of staying fairly well lubricated. So to everybody playing the, uh, the home version of DEF CON, Tradition. We have uh, we have shots here. Got one. <laughs> there we go. Cheers. All right, so Gal. Here's to you. Congratulations on uh, on making the stage. With my wife. Uh, congratulations <laughs> to your bride uh, on surviving you here with a with a, with a hacker who made it through DefCon. So here's to you. <laughs> Cheers. I drink to that. All right. Not a bad way to start. Okay. Okay, I'm glad Not we did all. that. <laughs> okay, so welcome to uh, Q and A with uh, Gal Zoror. Uh, Gal uh, gave a uh, fantastic presentation on uh, Ruckus wireless gear uh, and some of the uh, problems that seem to be resonant in that uh, uh, over and over and over again. Right. Um, so, uh, Gal, why don't you um, introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us, uh, tell us about yourself in case some folks uh, maybe glaze over that part of your presentation. Um, and we'll uh, start queuing up some of these questions from the uh, from the audience. Sure. So um, I work for um, Aleph Research, uh, which is a part of um, HCL uh, AppScan, and um, I've been uh, I've been doing reverse engineering uh, for something like 10, 11 years. Um, uh, especially uh, embedded devices. The, this is a subject that uh, I uh, was, uh, you know, I was exploring uh, for a while. And um, actually, it's something that I did not say in my talk. I, I talked about it in the previous talk was that the inspiration for this research uh, was uh, because uh, last year I visited uh, DEF CON and Black Hat and I noticed that uh, Black Hat are using uh, this gear. So this is what uh, started everything. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> you saw them in the wild and like, oh, no, nope, I got to do that. Right, right. I've heard about them, but I never really had the opportunity to really do a, a full research. And, um, and yeah, so it, it turns out to be two, um, two research. One was uh, uh, presented uh, half a year ago in uh, Lighting in uh, C, And uh, this one, which is the follow-up research that I managed to find uh, additional vulnerabilities and uh, some, um, some fixes that did not fix the, the vulnerabilities I already found. Well, very good. So you found a number of different problems and kind of triggered them to take some action on their part. Do you know, uh, it, does Ruckus actually patch any of their gear automatically such that, you know, what you found and what they did fix or try to fix, did that, did that get pushed out to all the, all the gear worldwide? Right. So um, as far as I know, uh, Ruckus avoid um, automatic update. I I understand where it comes from because, you know, pushing an uh, automatic update uh, through the air on network gear uh, might sometimes mess configuration and, and do some things that you don't necessarily want to, to, to happen. Uh, so I get, I get why they don't push their updates, but, um, but yeah, so I, I, the, the thing I, I think is the most important from my talks is Ruckus users should uh, stay up to date, um, you know, even even now, even uh, after this, uh, I, even my before my previous research and on this research as well, they need to keep everything up to date. So there's a general question out then from Hawkeye Dank about how did Ruckus respond to your research? Uh, what sort of a communication did you get back and forth with them? 
Yeah, so um, in uh, my research group, we, um, I think like uh, most of the, the research group, we try to uh, uh, do a full disclosure, uh, which is a 90 day disclosure. And uh, we focus both the first research and uh, this follow up research. Uh, we gave them enough time. Uh, eventually, it was uh, a bit more than 90 days. It was around uh, 100 and 100 and so days. And um, we just sent them a report with all the things we had found. We just talked about it a bit and they fixed, uh, well, they, they, they uh, tried to fix the, everything. Um, so uh, all in all, they did, the disclosure was pretty standard. That's a, it's one of the interesting things to have the conversation with folks about how did your disclosure go? How did that conversation go with the, uh, um, with the developers and with the people on that team? Because uh, there's a lot that you can learn about a company by how that relationship uh, evolves. And so that's uh, you know, nice to get that data point. Right. If if I may add uh, something, if we if we are talking about the uh, disclosure, I think one thing. If this is from my first research and not from this one, I think one thing that uh, uh, took Rakus by let's say a surprise was the fact that uh, I managed to recover a lot of uh, function names uh, from their binaries because they left a lot of debug information, both in the debug logs and uh, some uh, assertion in the in the code itself. Um, so, so yeah, so when I sent them the report, it was, you know, with the right function names and uh, the right architecture. So I think it was a bit of a shock for them, but well, it's, it's a lesson that, uh, I, I bet they learned to, to try to not give free, uh, free stuff for hackers. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Well, that, that goes pretty well with this question about uh, how does owning the device help you with the research that you did? Oh, yeah. So, um, well, yes, yeah, so my first research was done on emulation, 100% based on emulation. I just uh, um, extracted the firmware from, from Rakus, and then I managed to emulate uh, most of the um, of the device itself, uh, which uh, well, all the vulnerabilities were found on the web interface. So I managed to to get the the web interface uh, up and running, uh, which included different binaries. Uh, but I think when I got the actual device, when I bought it, so I bought it for I uh, uh, you know for live demos and and stuff. And so when I got the the device itself, I could I could uh, debug and see. Uh, uh, different, uh, different things that were, uh, more related to the configuration of the device itself. Because sometimes the device you get from the firmware, the device you emulate, not necessarily has the, all the configuration or all the binaries depends, you know, on, on how the, the vendor is deploying the, the firmware. And, um, yeah, and when I got the, the device itself, it really helped me to uh, override the admin credentials. So one of the vulnerabilities I demonstrated is uh, um, admin uh, override. And I, I just, you know, by debugging the, the, just the binary itself on the device, I could see all the files he tried to, like, which actually it was with a simple asterisk, all the files he, he was opening and writing to. And this is how I realized those are the configuration files that are important. And if I manage to overwrite one of them, well, specifically the sys.xml, uh, I would win. And uh, thankfully it happened. Well, so you're definitely not afraid of uh, diving into the very technical stuff here. So um, would you talk just a little bit more then about how, how that was different doing it, um, how you were able to find those things easier on the physical device than you were with the emulated device. I'd like to hear more about that. Right. Um, so uh, it, it's really common in uh, embedded devices that uh, they they usually separate the, the web server and uh, the logic to different binaries. And usually they find this uh, way to communicate uh, with each other. It's very popular to use um, um, Unix domain socket. And this is exactly the case in Ruckus. So um, so it, eventually the web server is just uh, talks with other services, with other binaries, with domain sockets. And uh, at first when I was emulating the, the device itself, I was emulating only a single socket to the logic itself. 
and that's about it. But uh, when I had a physical uh, device, I, uh, you know, just by running a, a, a simple TS on the device, I could see all the, the other binaries that I had to trigger and all the way, all the domain sockets they had to, to use to, to get everything uh, work together. So uh, yeah, that really, really helped a lot with uh, the other research. That's probably a good thing for a lot of folks who are getting into this field to have some understanding of is you can do a lot from emulation, but there does come a point where having the physical device is going to be a benefit to you. Right. I, I agree. I think that, um, well, if you put enough effort, I tend to think that you can get ev most of the things done by emulation um, depends user space, of course, but even you can even emulate like the, the kernel and Ruckus actually gives you the, the config file for the kernels itself. So uh, theoretically, you can just compile yourself the, the Ruckus kernel, exact kernel and run drivers and everything. But, but yeah, there, there's this, uh, uh, when, when having a physical device really, really, uh, speeds things up. Yeah. You can, you can, things that you need to, to, uh, spend some time and understand how to emulate. You just don't, you don't know, you don't need to do it. So it really helps. Very cool. Uh, kind of once, um, once you found out that Ruckus had, um, tried to fix uh, one of the vulnerabilities. How did you then figure out that they didn't fix it properly? Okay. Um, so, well, that, that was, uh, kind of a hunch because, so, uh, my first research, uh, I, I found several bugs, uh, and, um, and I, so when I got the, the fix, I was going through them. Uh, but I, I realized that the function they're using to validate the, actually the everything that they are validating, all the inputs from the user are, um, well, let's say it's not like airtight. It's not, they got some, uh, some bad, uh, practices there. And, and hopefully I was managed to find these, uh, three primitives, which were, the new line, the shebang, and uh, slash, and thankfully with those uh, with those primitives, I was able to to understand that this validation function uh, is not doing a good enough uh, job, and that's how I get uh, the the injection again to get the command injection back to work. So from the perspective of a bug hunter doing this work, um, would you in the future? change the way you wrote your um, bug report and sent that in to help the team uh, come up with more of these uh, to fix more of the the to fix more of your avenue in or would you do it the same way in the future you give them the this is the area that I hit and um, you know how would you structure that in the future knowing what you know now right um, so I think that, well, I, I did not know that they're using this. Uh, so apparently this validator function was been there the entire time, even before my research. It was using this bad validation function, um, like since, since the beginning of the first research. Uh, I would, if I would knew that they're going to use this function, and actually I, I did not knew this function even exists, but if I, if I knew that they're going to use it, I would definitely uh, tell them to use a different function with uh, a more robust uh, uh, white list or black list, to be exact. Do you think any of the uh, yeah. um, any of those vulnerabilities, like like that that function that you were just talking about, do you think that is present in other similar devices um, that that are, that are out there, or do you think that was kind of a custom rolled thing from Ruckus that it's going to be a one and done kind of deal. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, I think by, by the name of the functions, because a lot of, as I said before, a lot of information I managed to extract from the, the debug, uh, functions and debug, uh, logs in Ruckus. And because a lot of them are Ruckus related, I think that's only Ruckus code base. I don't think that other vendors are using this uh this code uh 
but what I uh, did realize, and I, I already mentioned it in the, in the research, I did realize that they're using this code base for, uh, for more than one product line. So for both of the product line, also the Wi-Fi controller, as well as the, at the access point, they all use the same code base. And that's why uh, they were vulnerable uh, to, both of them were vulnerable to some of the attacks. I like this. Hawkeye Dank has the question. Did you find a way to brick the ruckus? Brick? Uh, no, actually. So at, at first, yeah, well, while doing a emulation, it wasn't uh, even in my mind. Uh, but of course, when I bought an actual device, I bought two, of course, because I already broke, uh, bricked uh, some devices in my, uh, uh, in my, in back in the time. Um, so I, I, don't think because I was dealing with user space and uh, uh, nothing that was uh, too uh, deep in the internals of the of the device, I did not uh, manage to uh, break it. Although that, well, it was for another research, but I I realized that if you write echo like any any echo, write a, a, a character the a character to slash dev slash asterisk, usually. <laughs> The device get <laughs> get bricked. Uh, that happened to me before. I don't even know why I did that, but I just I think it was like a last uh, last resort. I was like, okay, nothing works. Let's try to echo to the entire dev, and that uh, worked poorly. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no rm slash rm minus rf slash, and no. Uh, uh, slash dev asterisk. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind the next time I'm hunting around in these things. Yeah. So um, in the Stack Overflow, um, did you have to use um, any sort of brute force to overcome the ASLR? Yes. So, well, um, so the, this Stack Overflow, I um, was lucky enough to just base it the, so the same payload for my first uh, Stack Overflow, although they were in different binaries. Uh, the the library that I was using to rope guide, to to create the rope chains uh, were both in Libc, so I only had to fix the addresses and basically I used the same gadgets. Um, but the thing is, so in in my first Stack Overflow back uh, back in my first research. I I was I was trying to to deal with the ASLR in a non uh, brute force way, um, yeah, just just to, to not to you know to create something a bit more uh, robust, and uh, I just decided after I I after I uh, found the command injection I just decided to ditch it because you know there's already an easier uh, exploit for it so let's just uh, uh, see like let's do a POC for the command injection. Uh, yeah, sorry for the Stack Overflow. And uh, on okay, so with, with this research, I uh, realized that because this is a different binary, this is the web server binary, which is way more bigger than the um, the, the ZAP binary from my first research. Um, so I think I can overcome the the ASLR not by doing brute force. Maybe just you know take something from the binary itself and use it. But uh, again, because I already, because I found and command injection as well, so I just decided to stick with, the, with the, the most basic POC because the command injection, in my opinion, is way more, it's not way more critical, but it's just different. It's easier to exploit. Um, you're talking about the web server. Can you, can you talk more about the um, web server correlation? uh with uh with the binary yeah um so uh the as i said as i mentioned before so the the web server is in and it's super common for embedded devices it uh just communicate with different uh processes with different binaries and uh one in particular was uh this uh like the device logic called emfd so uh this binary is the one that actually executes the commands and uh, just uh, uh, do like network configuration and, and just about everything. And uh, the interesting part about uh, about uh, 
this uh, binary is that Ruckus, so they, Ruckus were using um, this embedded JavaScript uh, developed, I think, by Embeddis. I'm not sure this is theirs, but I think, so they, they work together. Embeddis, the, which is the web server, supports the, uh, the embedded JavaScript, E-M-E-G-S. And um, so this, uh, uh, this back server or backend JavaScript, that was the one that, uh, this is the language they use to trigger different uh, function that would be sent to different binaries. So uh, I get into it in the first, uh, in my first talk, but also in, in my second, uh, that, uh, so they added uh, a code to trigger these, uh, these functions uh, that uh, were using the domain socket that I uh, talked about to, to just pass uh, commands to different uh, binaries. And some of them were uh, vulnerable. Um, Hawkeye Dank does ask the question here. He's talking about you found uh, cross-site scripting and some other exploits. Uh, was looks like he's specifically wondering about uh, C surf vulnerabilities. Did you find any C surf in there? Um, no, actually. So the the entire uh, C surf uh, token in uh, I didn't pay, pay too much attention to, uh, to it because. So in, in one of the pages or in, in some of the pages in, in Ruckus in the, in the embedded JavaScript uh, language that I mentioned before, some of them were uh, expecting a, a, a CSERF uh, token. But the thing is that some of them uh, looks to be like uh, uh, hard coded there. So probably I can just overcome uh, the, the, this token but I did not pay too much attention for it. I must uh, honestly say, uh, yeah, and uh, well, and the XSS uh, vulnerability as well, it, just, it was just out there. It just, for every request you send, you just get the, the reflected, uh, you know, reflection for what you send. So I'm like, okay, there's, there's an XSS here. I gotta, I gotta tell them. You can't not report that one when it, uh, you didn't, it sounds like you didn't really try it just, came back to you. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, and that, that's actually an interesting uh, idea of how you are approaching this. Uh, so if there are some vulnerabilities that just show up without you having to really hunt for them, um, when you are reporting that, um, do you ever leave commentary around, hey, so I found this one, I wasn't really looking for it, I didn't really hunt down this direction, um, or is this something that you're leaving open for future research for yourself? Or would you tell anybody else in the community, oh, hey, there's probably some findings here if you want to aim in this quadrant? Right. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, no, I don't uh, leave anything. Uh, I try not to leave anything uh, open. I just, you know, try to report everything that I, uh, you know, manage to to uh found even even things that are not necessarily a full exploit i would still let them uh know uh a good example for it is the information leakage i also uh, uh noticed that there's this page that you just go to this page upnp.jsp and you you get just everything about the the device and i'm like okay this is a bad practice it can lead to a jailbreak and you guys should fix it so no, I'm not. Uh, I I think that the responsible thing to do is just to uh, to tell them, uh, you know, to report everything that you find. But that being said, I must honestly say that the XSS I only reported on this report and not on my previous report because, as I said, it was really obvious. But I just, you know, I just I don't know if I forget or forgot about it. But I just on this uh, round, I just said, okay, I I have to report it. Very good. Well, we're uh, we're kind of coming to the end um, of the of the Q and A session, and one thing that uh, Fowler and I like to do is kind of give you an opportunity to talk to the community about what's next, right? What's next in this kind of vein of research? Where are you going to be taking this kind of thing next, and and where do you think that other people that are interested in the in the same kind of thing, how can they how can they take what you've done and then run with it in other directions? All right. Um, so. I um, I think so. In in our group, there are a lot of going on. We do uh, all 
different sorts of, uh, of research uh, project. And I think I already got another research that I just started. It's not going to be embedded devices because I just want to experience with something uh, else. Uh, probably going to be around uh, a bit a bit fuzzing, uh, and uh, and that, that's it for now. Uh, but um, except for that, uh, so in my group we are also uh, doing a very uh, impressive research on iOS emulation, uh, which is a really, really cool project that I might uh, also take some part of it. Or in general, I think I, I so as, as I already said, emulation in general, I think it's a, it's a really a good thing to have uh, in your arsenal as a, as a researcher. Um, uh, so yeah, so probably uh, some more emulation for sure. And then my next uh, research, I think is going to be, uh, I hope it's going to be on something else uh, with uh, brand new vulnerabilities. Well, there's good. a lot of exciting stuff to look forward to then. Uh, thank you very much. That's cool. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks. Um, uh, thank you, everybody for coming out for the Q&A session. And we will um, we will see you guys later on. Congratulations again on uh, on, on a great talk. And uh, happy anniversary. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you guys soon. Okay. Bye now.